we lost almost all of our revenue and we were on the verge of bankruptcy within yeah, three months of having gone full time. Welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category defining founders, all in just 40 minutes. Today, we're joined by Anna Hartvigson, Sunday Times bestselling author, the first Nordic woman to be named a Forbes 30 under 30 and co-founder of Female Invest. Female Invest is a global edtech platform on a mission to close the financial gender gap and smash through the glass ceilings along the way. Alongside her co-founders, Emma and Camilla, Anna has been on an incredible journey since starting Female Invest in 2020, including raising $23 million in funding to date, serving over 450,000 paying members in over 120 countries. She's also acquired Nordic fintech company Gaia Investments and written a global bestseller, Girls Just Want to Have Funds. More recently, Female Invest grabbed more headlines in the startup world with an 8.7 million Series A fundraise led by Edu Capital and Rubio Impact Ventures. With so much success already under her belt, I can't wait to hear more about her journey and her no doubt ambitious plans for the future. Anna, a big warm welcome to 40 Minute Mentor. Thank you for being here. How are things? Thank you for having me. Things are pretty good. We just closed our Series A a few weeks ago, which is quite a relief because it definitely was intense. So um, yeah, I'm a bit more relaxed today than I usually am. Well, congratulations. That is no mean feat in a difficult uh, environment to raise. So many congrats. I saw the news online and I've been very excited to have this conversation, especially at such an exciting time. So thank you for being here. We're going to warm you up with some quick fire questions. So please, can you finish the following sentences after me? Question one, success means to me... Freedom. Simple and perfect. It's so true. (laughs) The best day in my career to date was when? The first time I received feedback from a member saying that she started investing and how it had changed her confidence in life. Wow. Okay. Because that's when I realized that we really were onto something. Real validation. Yeah, I can imagine that's an amazing feeling. Awesome. One piece of advice that I would like to give my younger self is... Believe in yourself and don't listen to those who don't believe in you. I love that. I love that. It's so true. We should not listen to the haters. <laughs> so true. It's so difficult. Yeah, it's so, it is so difficult. That is true. But I think it's amazing how much emotional energy we spend on things we can't control and then people that actually don't always matter. But it's, yeah, it's a difficult lesson to learn. My biggest failure to date is... Failing to prioritize my health, I would say, as a founder. And that has been an ongoing thing a few times. Um, I think a lot of people recognize the feeling of getting so deep into work that you don't really listen to your mental health or your physical health. And that's definitely been a topic at the at different parts of the journey. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, but it's uh, not the first time I've heard it on this podcast and I can relate wholeheartedly. I've burnt out a few times and, um, you know, it's something that we we really like to talk about on the podcast because it's very easy when you're a founder, isn't it? Just to just keep going, keep going because, you know, there's so much at stake, but actually it's never worth it in the long run, is it? You've got to make sure you're prioritizing those things. And that's another reason why we want to talk about it, to encourage others to to really make sure they're looking after themselves. Because if you do that, you're probably going to perform much better in the long run. And that's what we want. Thank you, Anna, for being so open already and, and honest about those things. And I'm really excited to explore your career story. I guess we know that as people and leaders are shaped by their upbringing and early influences. So I would love, if you don't mind, for you to share a bit more about your upbringing. What was that like and how did it influence the kind of career that you've had to date? So I come from a small city in Denmark and where I grew up, both of my parents are chiropractors. But in the friend group that I had, we were a friend group of eight girls who were very close and still are today. I'm the only one who went to university actually where I come from, no one talks about money, no one talks about investing, and that definitely impacted uh, the journey that I've been on. I never met someone who started a business before I moved to Copenhagen and until many years later. So I think that has definitely shaped how I think about things. Um, That being said, I also come from a 
very resourceful home. So I've always gotten, you know, all the stuff I needed and more when it comes to help, emotional support and so on. And I think that has definitely given me a confidence that I brought into entrepreneurship as well, because my parents really taught me a grit and self-love, I would say. Love that. Thank you so much. Do you find you were always really interested in finance? And how did you personally become comfortable with discussing personal finances and, and investments? So I was always interested in money. And even as a kid, you would find me, you know, starting all sorts of small side hustles, selling stuff at the road, doing chores for the neighbors, making money and so on. Um, I started working when I was 13 years old, uh, working minimum wage, of course, and I've worked like every job you could imagine. And by the time I was 19, that meant I had actually saved up quite a bit uh, by working a lot and working really hard. And then I learned that there was something called inflation and something called interest rate. And I realized that the combination of the two meant that all the money I saved up was actually losing value on my bank account. And that's where my interest in investing came because I just couldn't live with that. And so I started looking into ways of getting around it. <laughs> that's brilliant it's amazing foresight really for someone that you know most of us don't really think about it we just spend our money and it's great that you got thinking about this early you've had a lot of success already with female invest and uh, uh, we're going to get onto those sort of milestones soon but let, let's turn back the clock and look at the the foundation and the i guess the genesis story so if i'm right in thinking you met your co-founders back at university so do you mind telling us a bit about how the idea for Female Invest came to be. So Female Invest, what it looks like today is definitely not how we imagined it in the beginning. As I mentioned, I never met someone who started a company, so I never thought that it was an opportunity for me. I met my two co-founders at university where we were kind of introduced through friends because we were all investing, which is quite unusual for women. And we were all talking about it and looking for other women who invested. So we were introduced. And then initially, we just wanted to make a small group of women who could talk about stocks, drink some wine, you know, eventually become friends. And we decided to name that group Female Invest. And we didn't know where to find other women who invested. So we made a Facebook group hoping to find like 10 to maybe 20 other women. And I remember so clearly the day we launched, we had more than 400 women signing up to join and that just blew our mind. And that was in 2018, I think. And then it just went from there. We started doing actually short educational events, first in group rooms at universities, then in big lecture halls. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. The media started writing about it. We started partnering with big companies just to physically fit. You know, a lot of women uh, toured around the Nordics and did in-person events for more than 25,000 women. And that was before we were even a company. We were just like a non-profit side passion project next to our uh, studies. So it really, I would say the community and the mission and the foundation was formed so long before we eventually became a company. Wow, what an amazing story. That's awesome. And I guess it would be it would be good to understand how that evolved and particularly I guess as as sort of co-founders and friends in the early days how did you split your responsibilities without stepping on each other's toes how did it kind of come to be a proper organization where you had to find roles like how did that all work in the early days it was definitely a work in progress something that worked out very well for us is that we were not friends before female invest because we just didn't know each other so female invest was always like the thing that brought us together and like the first thing we all had in mind, which means that meant that we didn't have, you know, history or friendships or personal relationships to think about when we made decisions. And now, of course, today, Emma and Camilla are some of my very closest friends. But I think we really made it this far because we always had female invest between us. We're very different. Also, the three of us. So the division of responsibilities came quite natural. Emma is yeah, very detail-oriented. Uh, she does the tech, the product. I like to sell. I like to hype people up. Um, so I do the growth of the business, the partnerships, the public speaking. And Camilla is extremely strategic. Like She's brilliant. And she does you know, the fundraising, the data, the content. And that works super well. 
Sounds like, yeah, the perfect uh, combination of skills and experiences. You've alluded to the fact that you've come a long way from 400 people joining a Facebook group to where you are today raising a Series A. So I guess I know some of our listeners will have heard of Female Invest, but for maybe those that don't know about the business, can you share what it is today, a bit about your kind of big mission in the world and what listeners can expect from signing up? Definitely. So we are the world's largest financial educator targeting women. So we have built a subscription-based edtech company. And the way it works is that you sign up and then you get access to all of the resources you need, not just to invest, but also to manage money in general, like videos, courses, webinars, experts, templates, and so on. We today have paying members in 120-something countries. We have more than at the time of this interview, 74,000 paying subscribers and yeah, hundreds of thousands of women have taken our free courses as well. So that's where we are today. Amazing. That is absolutely incredible. It feels like to go from those sort of, it really just came out of nowhere, really just a, a genuine, a shared connection over something that you, the three of you did, and then, you know, organically grew into this incredible business. I mean, huge kudos for everything you've achieved. That's a real story. So tell us a bit more about the journey. What were those early days like of actually when it started to become a real business? And how's that evolution been through the different stages of growth? So I think the time when it, when we really started feeling that this would be something more was when we realized that this was not just about us. You know, we started Female Invest because we personally experienced a problem. But the more we learned about that problem, the more we realized that this was actually a global problem impacting women in every part of the world. And that, you know, investing is not just about money. It's about freedom, power. It's about independence. And we just want more women to have more of that and once that mission part became so obvious, we just got obsessed and yeah, we just could not not work on it. And we actually all during our studies landed our dream jobs. I remember I signed with McKinsey, which was a big deal uh, back then as a consultant, you know, parents really happy. I worked very hard for it. But I think once you are obsessed with something, there was just no way you couldn't pursue it. So the early days were very scrappy. We had no money like at all. So in Denmark, you get paid for studying, which really saved us. So you get like around 800 pounds per month, which you actually can live off if you have super cheap rent and you eat like oats and maybe a carrot sometimes. So we did that uh, in the beginning. And then, yeah, we just started with nothing, basically no network, no experience, nothing. Wow. Okay. And how did it grow from that kind of very scrappy uh, beginnings to where the business is today? Take us through that journey, if you don't mind. So it was quite dramatic, actually, because when we eventually turned it into a business, no one really believed that we'd be able to scale, that we'd be able to monetize. But we turned it into a business and we went full time in January 2020. And we all know what happened shortly after the world closed and we lost almost all of our revenue. And we were on the verge of bankruptcy within yeah, three months of having gone full time, which was very, very stressful. And I especially remember one episode where we were just sitting in the office. You know, I was crying because we lost everything before it even started and we closed down our computers. We went outside, we went for a walk and just talked about how we should announce the bankruptcy to the world. And I went home in the worst mood ever. And then the next day I wake up because my phone keeps ringing and I can see that it's Camilla, one of my co-founders, and I don't want to pick it up, but she keeps calling me. And eventually I pick up the phone and she tells me that Forbes has just shared us on their Facebook page because we are on the 30 list in finance. And I mean, then we just rushed back to the office because you can't declare bankruptcy the day after. And then we brainstormed on how to do this and we decided to scale our online presence with, again, no money or anything. And we did that and we actually ended up bootstrapping the business up to the first 10 full-time employees. We won the world's largest startup competition as well, got $100,000 equity free. And then we just went from there, fundraised after a year. So yeah, it really was very pure passion and very very scrappy uh, circumstances and yeah we fundraised late 2020 yeah and then we went through by combinator as some of the only women sadly on our batch but that was really good for us in terms of network 
because fundraising and building a company when you know like no people at all is actually pretty difficult. And that just really gave us a blue stamp and we were in the top of our batch in terms of traction, growth, revenue, and so on. And I remember, so in Y Combinator, it's like a three-month program in Silicon Valley. And then it ends with a 60-second pitch. And that's like your 60 seconds to shine and convince investors. And I remember after our 60 seconds, we had more than 300 inbound messages from VCs wanting to invest. And that just catapulted us into like a new Liga, I would say, got some really awesome investors on board and then, yeah, scaled from there. Wow, what a story. And a great story of kind of almost bankruptcy to then, you know, not long after being on pitching at Y Combinator, which is one of the most prestigious accelerators to be on. And then now we're at Series A. I mean, what a tale of, uh, you know, bouncing back from a near death experience, which they often say a lot of founders need. And that's a, it's almost like a rite of passage, isn't it? I guess you've already alluded to probably one of the hardest moments I would imagine on your journey, but have there been, any other big challenges you've had to overcome in the scaling of Human Invest? Yes. One challenge that I didn't anticipate would take up so much energy, and this is probably still, I would say, our biggest challenge is not actually building the company, it's dealing with everything around it. So obviously, we are very mission-driven, and we are trying to change the status quo, and that comes with a very surprising amount of resistance and hate from some groups. And you would think, you know, after having done this for a few years that you kind of get thick skin or that you don't care. But that has actually been very challenging for us, both in the beginning, but also now, um, you know, just dealing with that. So I would say the personal side is actually probably the one uh, we all struggle with the most. What people that don't want women to develop these skills and experiences and who are just against the mission? That's shocking. Yes, but it often wouldn't come out that way. So sometimes it comes out that way, but then it's more in, you know, questioning our ability to build a company, writing, you know, very, very nasty messages that are, you know, hidden in something else. A lot of comments about looks and appearance also online, both anonymously and not anonymously. And yeah, it just gets very exhausting. And especially, you know, all of the comments around competency Like in the beginning, when we didn't have that many achievements to look at, it was very difficult to not take it in because I think most entrepreneurs feel like, you know, they're building as they're going. So there are a lot of things to be unsure about. Now I feel a little bit better because I can look at, you know, the facts of what we achieved. So obviously with these achievements, there's no way that we're completely incompetent, but it still is quite something to deal with, I would say. I'm so sorry to hear that. That is just misogyny at its worst and uh, the great thing is that I have no doubt that you're continually proving everybody wrong that's uh, stupid enough to to have a go like that I mean it still blows my mind there are people like that and I'm sorry you went through that it's so unfair but we will focus on the good stuff which is that you've scaled this rocket ship to over 70,000 members you've opened two offices in Copenhagen and London there is so much to be so proud of. Do you mind sharing a bit about the biggest lessons that you've learned from that? Because that is real hyper growth. And it feels like you're kind of, you've been through lots of ups and downs there. But what have been the lessons that you would most like to pass on to fellow entrepreneurs that might be listening to this? Yeah, so I think the two biggest lessons are quite simple, but they're also quite difficult to live. Um, I think the first one is to just do it. Like action is always better than perfect. And it's so tempting to, you know, keep improving your plan or your product before you launch it, but you just need to get it out and you need to learn. And I think that's where a lot of companies go to die, that the people at the top just don't take action fast enough. And then I would say the second one is to keep learning all the time, both developing personal skills, but also figuring out what's what's going on in the industry, what are others doing, how can we be better because there will always be new stuff to learn. But the action one is probably the main one. This episode is brought to you by Unleashed, the people and culture experts for leaders who do business differently. Trusted by the most progressive businesses, the Leadership Institute accredited Unleashed development programs harness the power of community learning, helping leaders develop skills, behaviors, and relationships they need to cultivate high performance across organizations. As a 40 Minute Mentor listener, you'll know firsthand the importance of leaders in high performance culture. If your leaders aren't performing brilliantly, then your business won't either. 
Unleashed is part of the Amplified Group, the people services supergroup that supports tech companies from inception all the way to IPO. So if you want to find out more about Unleashed or any of the other Amplified Group services, then please get in touch on say hello at unleashed.company. And I guess a part of growing a business is obviously hiring. And we know, I guess, from our day job, but just every founder that comes in this podcast, hiring is not always the easiest thing to do. So how have you approached recruiting talent and building your own sort of culture? Yeah, actually, one more thing I would like to add first is also to have common sense. I think sometimes we like to complicate things, you know, so much. And it's quite easy to forget that the best solutions are often the simple ones so common sense, I would like to add as a third one. So how have we hired? So in the beginning, we didn't really have a process. We hired people we kind of knew. We hired kind of those we met. We didn't get that many applications because we didn't have a brand. Now, of course, now it's different. Now we get hundreds, if not thousands of applications when we post a job, which is a very privileged position to be in. So now we actually have quite a strict hiring process and quite a, quite a standardized one. So... We look at a mix of experience and personality, depending on the role. Everyone we hire takes a personality test just to see how they would fit uh, the respective teams. And everyone will solve a case. So that means we'll give them a task of something that looks like what they would be doing in the job. So we get an idea of how they think and how they work. And then we always have three interviews as well, where they meet different team members and where they also um, yeah, meet all of the founders so we each talk to every single person joining the company and we are 35 employees today okay amazing and how would you describe your culture and what are the kind of typical characteristics that have really when you're hiring that you feel like work really well with your business like that kind of value alignment yeah so the most important things we look for is problem solving skills being targeted and then of course being kind and empathetic as well and I think that encapsules also the culture uh, that we try to build. So we are mission driven to the core. Uh, we want to change the world. We want the workplace to be a nice place to come in. We want people to have fun while doing it. And I think this is often quite misunderstood around mission driven companies. You also don't change the world, or at least I haven't figured out how to do it like nine to five. That just is not going to gonna happen. And that's also something we have to really align with everyone who applies because we also have a lot of people coming in thinking it's a bit more, you know, chill and a bit softer values. And while we do have those values, it's also like a very work hard, play hard. And then we make sure to celebrate and support our team where we can. Yeah, I love that. That's really important. And yeah, I think when you are trying to make such a big impact in the world and help so many people and make a real change, that does require a lot of hard work and perseverance. And yeah, I think it's important to be honest about that. There's nothing wrong with that. I think most of the clients that we have have a similar sort of culture. But as you say, I think the, the important thing is that there's the, it's a great place that people want to come and that uh, their success is recognized. And I think that's, that, that really that makes people want to kind of keep coming back to the office and feel really aligned to such an exciting mission i guess when you think about the future um, and your growth plans i guess particularly for the year ahead because I, I envisage there'll be people listening to this going i really want to work for anna so what have you got to look forward to that you can share our listeners uh, with so i mean a lot has happened but we are only just getting started so the plans now is of course to keep scaling we have members in 120 countries but we want to penetrate the uk which is our fastest growing market even more and then next year, we will be entering the US as well. And we already started prepping and soft launching a little bit. So very exciting. We also have plans to launch a trading platform. So right now we do education, but we actually acquired a company that has a trading platform and we hired the guy who built it, got all the tech. And now we already launched a trading simulator. So when you are a member, you get all the learning. You can also buy real stocks, but with fake money. And now we're building out that simulator um, and we'll be plugging in a license during next year so that we become much more fintech. So yeah, definitely some exciting product skills, really moving into the fintech space and then also going to the US. 
How exciting. Awesome. And I'm sure those YC connections will come in handy as you uh, expand into the US market. That's uh, that's really cool. I want to move the conversation on to fundraising. You've raised $23 million to date, which is an incredible achievement. And I'd love to hear the secrets behind your fundraising success and particularly any tips you can pass on to others that might be going through the same cycles that you've been through, whether that's seed or, or series A. Something I don't think we talk about enough is that not all tips will be applicable to everyone. So I'll share mine in a moment. But before we started fundraising, we, of course, listened to podcasts. We talked to other founders who raised, but a lot of them were were male as well and had very different lifespans. Like we, we fundraised twice with a pregnant founder, for example. We closed the day before my co-founder's due date. Actually, she was giving birth the day we announced it. And that just means that the typical, you know, advice just didn't apply to us in the same way or our journey was different, I would say. So in my experience with the journey we had, I experienced like my best piece of advice would be to have a healthy business. And beforehand, we heard that, you know, drinking coffee or keeping up connections was the most important part. But when you are uh, raising a Series A, at least in our case, you know, and in general, no one will invest just because you had drank a lot of coffee or they really like you. So if you have to prioritize as a founder your time, don't prioritize it drinking like coffee a full day per week. Build a business, have strong numbers, and that will attract investors. The next one would be to tell a clear and compelling story. It's I very often see uh, founders where, you know, even after going to the website of their company, I still don't understand exactly what they do and who it's for or where they're going. So having that both in the deck and in the data room, I think is extremely important. And then I also think just being fast, like answer fast. And when you get a data request, send it fast and always do it at a very high level. So I think for us, it was much less about personal connections and much more about just having a high level in both business and communication and especially as women because as we know less than two percent of funding goes to women i used to think that that's because women maybe don't i don't know apply for funding that much or they don't want to scale in the same way but now having gone through it and comparing our journey to our male colleagues it's just a very different journey so if you are a woman or also a person of color, because that's even worse statistics, you just have to be better and it sucks, but you might as well like face it and then try to be better if you want to raise, unfortunately. Yeah, so unfortunately that is the case. Thank you for sharing those great, great bits of advice. I guess you, you recently closed the Series A and this is the difficult climate to do that. So that's a, an amazing achievement. How did you find that round versus the previous ones? And is there anyone anyone that might be going through that now that just anything that, that maybe surprised you about it or anything that you did, had to do differently? Yeah, so this round was a lot harder uh, than we expected to. So we raised $11.2 million in this round and the rest we raised in pre-seed, seed, seed, bridge. We also raised money during the boom in 2021. And that was so easy. Like I felt like investors were just throwing money at us. Uh, Some even, you know, committed to quite high amounts during like the first Zoom call. But here it took like a lot, a lot more. So a very important piece of advice would be to start before you think you need it because it will take longer. And if you're running out of money, it's just not great because you become desperate and you can't negotiate as well. So start rather too soon than too late would be my best tip. Yeah, very true. And what are you planning on using these funds for? Uh, clearly, you mentioned there's there's lots of exciting plans coming down the line, but but is there a particular, is it mainly for expansion into new markets like US and UK? Is it hiring? Where do you spend all that money? So hiring is a big one for sure. And it will be hiring people for the market expansion. So specifically entering the US, where we'll also have, or we anticipate quite a lot of costs with regards to entering the American market and then also trading. And that's actually especially hiring costs, as you say, in building it and then also maintaining all the legal requirements about around being regulated. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of those things are quite expensive. So it's good that you raised a, a chunky round. <laughs> well, we wish you the best of luck with all of that. It's very exciting times. And I also know that you ran a crowdfunding campaign that broke all sorts of records. So I'm conscious I crowdfunding's come up on this podcast before. We've actually had the founder of uh, Cedars has been a guest. We would love to understand sort of why you chose crowdfunding. And for anyone that might be considering doing it, what were your biggest learnings from that experience? So, I mean, the concept of crowdfunding is to give your audience and give your community ownership in the business. And because Female Invest is such a community-driven business, we thought it made great sense. And also our members has asked for years if they could invest in Female Invest. It didn't make a lot of financial sense for us. It would have been a gazillion times easier and a lot cheaper for us to just take the money from VC. We only raised $1 million, so a very small amount of the overall round, but we did it because we wanted to bring our community closer. As you mentioned, we broke four world records and not just for female founders, but like total and everything from, you know, fastest to a million dollars. It took four minutes only, even though we had like a cap on how much people could invest of 3000 pounds. So it was pretty low. We had more than 13,000 people signed up uh, to invest, which was also a world record. We beat Revolut actually and two other records. So I would say that good thing about crowdfunding is that you definitely build a stronger and more loyal following, but I probably would not do it again. I think if I started a new business, it would be great for the early days, but it was a lot of a, a lot, a lot of legal work, also much more than we anticipated and a lot more admin. And I think had we taken all that money and all that time that we spent on the crowdfund and spend it on building the company to help more women and expand on the mission, it maybe would have been spent better. But yeah, it's not that I regret it because I'm so happy to have our members, but I also don't know if I would do it again. Yeah, well, it, thank you for sharing because I think that's really, these are important things for anybody considering it now to be aware of. It's uh, And I've heard that before. It's not something just to do lightly. I think that's uh, the big takeaway. Thank you so much for sharing. What How amazing is that though? Those records and uh, again, further validation of the great work you're doing and, and how much interest there is and support for the mission, which must be make you very proud. I want to talk about closing the financial gender gap. You know, female investors born out of this mission to do that and i feel like there has been some progress in recent times certainly a lot more discussion around this topic but clearly so much more work to be done so how do you see the state of the financial gender gap in 2024 i'd say that the more i educate myself on the topic the less optimistic i am we're actually not doing very well on anything anywhere in the world like at best we're kind of stagnating also in you know developed countries and i think it's quite easy to be tricked because we talk so much about it there's so much wonderful debate and awareness going on but when we look at the real numbers nothing is really happening and that goes for the gender wealth gap okay now i mean we have a generational shift so a lot of money will be inherited but like the the amount of women investing the pay gap the gap that arises after having a child, even the amount of money that goes to female founders, it's not, we're not seeing big moves. And I really believe, or we really believe at Female Invest that if we want to see real change, we have to create it ourselves as women and of course all the allies. We can't wait for you know the leaders of the world to take action or change laws and regulation because it's gonna take too long. So yeah, we believe we have to take action and if we do it, then we can create positive change for everyone, men included, because it benefits society and companies and individuals when women have more money. Absolutely. And like other, is there a particular call to action that you like to share with our listeners, whether it's for VCs or leaders in general, just to, to actively contribute to closing that gender gap? There are two things that anyone can do. So the first thing is to believe in women, both the women themselves, but also the world around them. And then the second one, and this goes for both women and men and non-binary people, everyone, is to be aware of your own bias. Because growing up in the world the way it is today, like we all grow up with biases, like even just, I mean, watching uh, movies or seeing, you know, what type of people lead companies and what, what type of people work service jobs. Like we all grow up and we get these ideas of what, I know a leader looks like or a savvy investor or whatever it is looks like. 
And I think there's no shame in admitting that we have these biases and we can't improve them and we can't improve ourselves before we realize that we have them. So really taking responsibility for our own biases and challenging ourselves also when we judge someone and we think maybe they aren't competent or they aren't knowledgeable enough or they're a little bit like too much, then checking in with ourselves if we would have thought the same had they looked differently. And that's a difficult task to do and it's uncomfortable, but um, I urge everyone to do it. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really great point. Something that we all should all take some time to reflect on. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you for sharing. What are your own learnings from your experience of getting more clued up on on all things finance and starting to invest? Because for anyone that's listening to this saying, I, I, I'd, I'd love to, but I've, I don't know what I'm doing. Can we talk about actually what you've taken from that experience? And particularly maybe some of the early mistakes you might have made that any listeners sort of going on this journey might be able to avoid? So the biggest myth out there is that investing or managing money is difficult. It's not. And I think that's what's keeping a lot of people from getting started, including myself uh, in the beginning, because I thought it was so overwhelming and I was so afraid of making mistakes. But in reality, managing money is very, very simple. Uh, it's not that difficult. Being a good investor is also not rocket science. Like in short, if you you know diversify, you get the average market return, and then you wait for like five, ten plus years, then you've actually probably done pretty, pretty well already. So my best tip would be the same as my best tip when starting a company, and that is to just do it, take action. It's a lot better than not taking action. Yeah. And what advice do you have for any women listening to this that really want to start making their money work more for them? So my best tip would be to make a plan of where you want to be in the next five to 10 years, just so you know if you have any big expenses like a house, a wedding, having children, a big trip, and so on coming up. And then budgeting sounds very boring, but figuring out how much money you have left each month after you paid fixed expenses, how much money you'll need to save up for a potential big thing or just for an emergency savings account and then investing the rest. And when it comes to investing, it's also important to not just invest all of your savings at once. We usually talk about gradual investing or dollar cost averaging where you invest a little bit every month. Make sure fees don't eat too much, but invest a little bit every month. And then you'll over time get a nice average price. Yeah, that's really great to hear. And I hope lots of our listeners, if they've been a bit nervous to do it before, will uh, take a lot of uh, inspiration from you and and get going because it's something that I wish I'd have started much earlier. And I think there's a lot of people I speak to that think, oh, if only if only we'd have sort of had these sorts of conversations 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So it's really amazing. With Sally and end, Anna, I really love this conversation and I could talk to you for hours, but but you have lots of things to do. You have big ambitions ahead and I'm super excited to see where your journey takes you. But we are on 40 Minute Mentor. So for our wrap up questions, I have to ask if you could be mentored by anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? I think it changes over time with Emma and Camilla, my two co-founders. We often talk about having like professional crushes at like different states of our career so people we really look up to at different stages people who are you know or have gone through something that we are going through in that moment so right now and um, you know the big challenge is to kind of take our company to the next level and deal with personal stuff so probably someone who had done that but um i actually don't have a name popping uh, into my mind right now no, that's okay. That's all right. Have you got your own mentors at the moment? Is mentorship something that you kind of think about and have people that you you look to for advice or, or support? Interestingly, not that much. So I think our entrepreneurial journey has been quite lonely. We had at some points in the beginning, which was amazing. We had some mentors, especially one. And then, of course, we get a lot of great advice from our investors, sometimes from other founders, but we actually haven't had anyone following us and something I think has been quite a challenge which again we also didn't think about until we got here is that as I said when it comes to funding in order to apply advice from someone they have to live approximately the same life as you so you know if you have a child it's hard to take advice from someone going on the same journey without a child for example because they don't have to take care of it and 
our network within female founders who have built businesses that are bigger than ours are unfortunately not that big. And I think that's what would be like especially helpful. Of course, men could also be our mentors, but I think someone living the same life, especially with children coming into the picture, I actually, yeah, I can't think of anyone in our network who would be further ahead um, with small children, for example. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that's something we can help with because there's uh, we've had some amazing female entrepreneurs that come on this podcast that we could definitely connect you to. But thank you for sharing. Well, that would be amazing. And there are a lot of amazing ones. It's just that I don't unfortunately have them in my network, but I wish and I admire from a fan. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's one of the, the great things about being in this 40 minute mental community. There's some amazing people to connect with. So we'll make sure that happens. And finally, what is one piece of career advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Just do it. Like, if you have an idea, just test it out. If you aren't sure if it's going to work, test it out. If you don't know if you're good enough, I mean, there's only one way to find out. Just do it. Just try it. That's such a great place to end this. Thank you, Anna. It's been a real privilege and a pleasure to hear your story. And thank you for sharing your mentorship with us all. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really hope that you found it useful and inspiring. If we have left any questions unanswered or if you have any feedback or guest recommendations for future series, then please make sure you get in touch on info at jbmc.co.uk. I often get asked by listeners how you can help us spread the word about 40 Minute Mentor. There are two simple ways you can help. Firstly, share this episode on your preferred social media platform and LinkedIn is probably where I'm most likely to see it. And you can also leave us a review on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Every share on social media and review left on the podcast platforms really helps us to get 40 Minute Mentor in front of new audiences and share the power of mentorship even further. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday for even more pocket-sized mentorship. Mm